All right. Recording. All right. You tell me when you're uh, when you're ready when you've got enough lead. All right. We got. You can go. Because because the reason you need that lead is is so that if the uh, beginning of your reel to reel uh, gets munged, you don't ruin the. Uh, Mm. Which is not a which is not a thing with uh, digital <laughs> technology, but it's a leftover from my yeah. training. Yeah, well, and it also it also is useful for finding the beginning. It's easier to find the beginning if you've got lead, even on digital editing. All right, here we go. In three, two. Coming up on DTNS, we talk to four of the greatest listeners in the greatest audience of all time. It's the Daily Tech News Show, listener co-host show. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, December 26, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm the show's producer, which you can't see right now, I'm Roger Chang. Welcome to our end of the year listener co-host show, the annual episode where we invite several of our supporters to appear alongside us on the show. And this time we're very excited to have William Chance Perigini, a.k.a. Chance the Hacker. How's it going? It's going wonderful. I'm really excited to be here and great to meet you guys. Close listeners of the show will have heard us read emails from Chance before. Uh, we also have Zoe did you bring bacon, Zoe? Um, let me just check. <laughs> yes, I have got bacon. <laughs> Quite a nice supply. So you know what's you can funny? all have a piece. There's plenty for everybody. I was uh, <laughs> I threw on a, a hoodie uh, today, and in the pocket of the hoodie was a piece of bacon that Zoe had given me in Las Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, still residing to, in the hoodie. Goes so. to show you either yeah. don't put your hands in your pockets or have them worn that jacket for a while. <laughs> uh, Sheila Dunn, the communications director for the National Motorists Association, is also with us. Welcome, Sheila. Yes, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, longtime supporter of the show, Chris Allen, former software engineer, now owner of the Cleveland Rock Gym in Cleveland, Ohio. Thank you, Chris, for joining us. Hey, thanks for the invite. I really appreciate uh, you guys having me on. Now, the way we're going to do this, uh, we'll we'll go around the horn and talk to each one of you in turn with some questions. If you have questions for each other uh, at any point, uh, don't don't feel afraid to to jump in and ask. Uh, this is just kind of an open forum. Uh, but Sarah, what do you say we start with Chance? I think we should. Um, William Chance Perigini, Chance the Hacker. <laughs> Freelance web developer, building websites for small businesses. His website, yep. which is a soft skills blog, is chancethehacker.com. But we wanted to we wanted to get to know our, our listener co-hosts a little bit better. So we're gonna start with the, kind of the obvious. How long have you been in this business? How long have you been doing web development? Um, so I'm relatively new to it actually. I'm a career switcher. So for most of my life, I've been doing demolition. And um, I am currently a demolition site supervisor right now. And uh, past, I'd say, three years, four years, I've been teaching myself to code and uh, build websites. And uh, also, I like eth ethical hacking a lot, too. Um, so, yeah, I don't know, about three or four years I've been doing this, and I'm kind of swapping over right now. Do you demolish large buildings, small buildings? Like, what do you demolish, I should ask? Um if it needs to come down, I will tear it down. Uh, I have I've worked in chemical plants. I've worked with highly lethal chemicals. Uh, I have worked on tiny little buildings. One time, I just demolished a little shack and uh, got paid for that too. So, yeah, <laughs> I've done it all. I feel like, like Chance could help me with my power washer. No problem. Yeah, I like fixing stuff. I'm a tinkerer for sure. So was it uh, pe getting tired of people calling you demolition man that, that made you want to become a coder? <laughs> like, how did, how did you make the, the transition? So it's actually my back decided for me because um, mm. I'm getting, I'm about 34 years old, almost 35. And uh, I've been trying to impress everybody with my strength for so long that uh, it's all going, you know. And uh, swinging big sledgehammers and those kinds of things really beat you up physically. So... I decided I wanted a nice cushy job where I can sit at home and just press keys. Um, it's it's I mean it's that's that makes sense and I'm glad that it's better on your back. Uh, how long did you kind of think about doing this before you decided to make the leap? 
Um, well, it's so it, I've always been into computers. You know, I love video games, especially uh, when I was 16. I was teaching myself how to write my own video games and that kind of stuff. Uh, I started with Warcraft 3. They had like a little create your own game mode in there. And so I kind of taught myself how to use it. And then I just stepped away from it and focused on demo for a long time. Um, eventually, somebody showed me that you can just learn coding online, which I didn't think that was possible. I thought I was kind of stuck in demolition forever. And a friend just showed me, hey, look, just go to Udemy.com and you can learn anything there. So I did. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of stuff do you like to, to code? What kind of projects are you want to work on? Uh, I like, I just, I really like building creative websites with uh, really interactive UIs. I love animation. Um, so I'm really big into just animating stuff. Uh, that's why, if you remember, I sent you that email with the uh, animation stuff on yeah, Firefox. Yeah. I just think animations are really cool. So I like making pretty stuff. Um, you know, if I want it to look good, I want it to function well, and I want Mozilla to get there. Uh, together. <laughs> you so know, you after mentioned years of destroying, you now want to create. I yes, guess. Yeah. exactly. I mean, you Flowers mentioned you, you learned so many things online. How long did it take before you felt like, okay, I can actually do this as a job. I know what I'm doing. Actually, that that's only come recently. And uh, I just kind of just forced myself into it. I never really felt that way. I never got that like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm just a web developer now. I just started telling people I was. And then <laughs> Uh, I forced myself into that, you know, you really, ha you never, you're never going to feel confident in yourself. Like I always felt stupid. I was like, oh, why is this so easy for so many other people? And it's so hard for me, you know, it's so frustrating, but, uh, I just did it. <laughs> well, and I think, I think we all suffer from that, that sort of overestimation of how easy it is for someone else, right? Oh, yeah. It kind of goes along with that psychological thing where you underestimate how hard someone else's job is. You mm -hmm. also sometimes I think look at other people and go, oh, well, it comes so easy for them. Why is it so hard for me? You just probably don't see how hard it is uh, for other people. And like I say, the solution is just kind of keep at it, right? Well, yep. and there's sort of that confidence that goes with saying to somebody, yeah, I can do this, knowing in your heart, I don't know how to do this, but yeah. I'll learn and I will yeah. and I will come through. And oh, yeah. I think I think that pressure sometimes drives a lot of us to learn things that we otherwise would think were out of our skill range. Oh, for sure. Yeah, like I was I was really, really doubting that I was going to be able to do it. But the one thing I really had faith in is that I would be able to figure it out. Not necessarily that I'd be able to do it, but I would be able to teach myself how to do it. That's great. That's great. So uh, do you have any questions for us? I want to know, you know, you guys are asking me how I switched to the web development. I want to know how you guys switched into podcasting. That's really interesting to me. Yeah, well, I think Tom and Roger and I all have somewhat similar stories, but um, but I'll go ahead and start. I mean, when people say, what do you do for a living? I say, I produce podcasts. And they go, wow, cool, weird, how, where? <laughs> uh, and I say, I used to work in television. That's what I, I went to school for that. I went to school for broadcasting. I, I, I wanted to work in television, not necessarily film, but certainly, you know, motion pictures. And uh, over time... The internet just uh, got to a point where uh, jobs started to crop up where we now had online video jobs and you could produce things that were on the web because video production had gotten to a point and bandwidth had gotten to a point where you could deliver that to people and now that's how everything is 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 going. So it, it kind of just happened to me, but I'm glad it did because for me, it gave me so much more flexibility. I mean... I live in my garage. Well, I don't live here, but I work in my garage, you know, in, in, in the forest. And that would never have been possible when I started my career. Yeah, for me, uh, podcasting came along in 2004 and I was immediately fascinated with it because I had been in radio in my teens and 20s. Uh, my first job was in 1986 at a radio station and I, and I missed doing radio. So I wanted to do podcasting uh, from the first moment I heard about it. it took Till about January 2005 to convince folks at CNET that this is something that we wanted to do. And that's where I was working at the time. And then uh, around February, we started doing test episodes of a show with me and Molly Wood. 
March 30th, we finally posted one for other people to hear. And uh, that was the Buzz Out Loud podcast that I started doing at CNET. And I did that from 2005 till 2010, at which point Leo Laporte offered me a job at his Twit network uh, to do a similar show, a daily news show about tech. Uh, and, uh, so I started working there, was reunited with working with Sarah, uh, on that show. And, and then, uh, eventually, uh, had to move to Los Angeles, did a year with Twit before they decided they didn't want to have me in Los Angeles anymore and, uh, went out on my own. So really it was just, it was seeing podcasting out there and, and saying that's something I want to do. And then continuing to keep doing that until it became the only thing <laughs> that I do, if that makes any sense. I don't know. Um, for me specifically, uh, after I left Tech TV, the, f the few other places, uh, the, the, the following three places I worked at all had some sort of web video or audio component to it. So I just sort of kind of naturally fell into it. Uh, I did a podcast back at uh, um, uh, Ziff Davis at the publishing side. And then when I went over to Riven th Vision 3, a lot of the content was video, but some of it actually dovetailed into audio as well so it was just kind of a natural fit and so when i left when i uh, when revision three and i parted ways uh tom asked me if like hey can you give me a hand with this stuff and i said sure why not i got nothing else to do <laughs> and it's been that way ever since <laughs> all right let's uh let's Turn to uh, Zoe Detterding, a volunteer for a UK charity, Age UK, which helps older people use technology and clients normally bring in their own tablets, phones, laptops, tablets, cameras, other gadgets. Uh, charity also provides other sorts of, of help. Uh, Zoe, you're always good at bringing titles into uh, our chat room and, and, of course, bringing the virtual bacon and coffee. But it sounds like you're bringing a lot of help to people, too. That's great. Yeah, um, I really enjoy listening to people's stories. And quite often they come in for the social aspect anyway. Um, and it's quite a skill sometimes working out what their problem is. So uh, interpreting their, their stories. And uh, But yeah, I really enjoy you know, helping with, a, with the technology. So uh, it could be anything from setting up an email address, um, attaching a, a photograph to it or something. They might even have a little um, navigation device for their car. Um, sort of anything really. So it's quite a challenge. You never know what you're going to get every day. It's like uh, I'm, I'm only there once a week. Sometimes I pop, pop in other days as well. But uh, um, but we're sort of in contact, uh, yeah, throughout the week and helping each other as well. Sometimes we get emails from the other volunteers, sort of sorting out problems. So yeah, it's uh, very interesting. <laughs> yeah. Do Do you find the most challenging aspect to be that communication you talk you're talking about yeah um because quite often they might know what their problem is but being able to describe it efficiently and they're trying to be helpful by using terminology that we that they think is the correct terminology <laughs> but so often then they're, they're not using quite the right words um so they've, they've heard about uh, a browser but they're not using it in the right way mm -hmm. um and uh, quite often we're the, we're the person who sorts out a problem, um, perhaps the son or daughter or spouse has uh, tried to troubleshoot and uh, then they come to us because, as we quite often know, the family members aren't always very patient. <laughs> right. so, um, I set it up the once. I'm not available yeah, for it. Yeah, so um, we are a lot more patient. We like to think we're very, very patient and uh, yeah, sort of um, can listen and uh, yeah, interpret what what the problem is. So, do you um, do you find the family members sometimes maybe the cause of the issue? Yeah, time? yeah, it can be. <laughs> um, but actually, quite often a family member will suggest they get a smartphone, and it turns mm. out you know one or two people who come in they don't even have a phone anyway, and they really don't need a smartphone. They just need a phone because they they just want something that can text or. Oh, crap. Um, you know, make calls. They don't need one of these fancy computers in their pocket. So identifying actually what the real issue is um, is is sort of half the challenge sometimes. <laughs> yeah. So if people are bringing in trouble, you must have a good overview of yeah of which things happen the most often. Uh, is is there a Is there something that you see over and over again? Um. 
it's fairly split, I would say. I wouldn't say necessarily you get one problem um, more than any other. And there's, it's, there's so many, so many devices and so many things and so many problems that um, we have. Uh, we have about uh, four computers. We have four desktop computers in the room. And it always used to be the case they would come in and use one of our machines, but now they're coming in with their own devices. So I'm talking about when I started 10 years ago and they'd all come in, they'd learn how to use a computer. And now they're coming in with their own tablets and they very rarely use one of our desktop computers. But it's so varied because there's a lot more technolo technology um, that, yeah, it's sort of get any, almost anything thrown at you. It might be Apple, it might be Samsung, it might be any make, you know, and... Uh, so it's, it can be quite challenging, but uh, so yeah, you can't so. point out one device. You're like, it's always that one. That's always causing people the problems. Yeah. Nothing, it's um, all spread out. What I find interesting is that we've only had recently one person with a with a Chromebook. Mm. Um, I don't know if they're a lot more popular in the states, but I've only come across one person with a Chromebook mm. in the last um, well, as far as I can remember. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know if you know how popular they are in the in the UK, but. They just well, they're, they're fairly spiked. popular, but usually in educational settings. So it may just be that yeah. the older demographic uh, doesn't yeah. have them as often, or maybe they're causing them less trouble. I don't know. I mean, it seemed to me that they're a perfect machine for people who aren't very tech savvy. Mm -hmm. Perhaps got their, mm -hmm. getting the first machine or something. I would, would assume, though, that having having so many folks who have, have their own devices and they bring mm -hmm. them in and say, please help, and of course you want to, if yeah. they're if they're sitting down at the computer that is, is already there and you know how it works you know how to log in you know you know how to teach somebody something that's one thing but the personalization of everything is a whole added layer i mean i had somebody down at the market the other day say like, can you help me log into my ipad and i was like probably not uh because that's your thing yeah. uh, so that 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 probably is pretty challenging yeah actually come to think of it the i would say actually the biggest problem is passwords because that's not always something that we don't know the answer to it. <laughs> um, right. They're all What's pretty my good password? at having. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, they're all pretty good at uh, having a notebook and they write things. So actually, the biggest challenge is not necessarily making a note of it, but understanding their notes. Mm -hmm. So they'll say, we'll ask them a question about something, and they'll say, oh yes, I wrote it down, and then, but it might have been a year ago. And so there's, they're flipping through the pages <laughs> and there's no like heading to the instructions. So they don't even know what they're looking at and they haven't really written efficient instructions. So actually to try and when you see them writing, actually to help them write notes that they understand a year later or something like that. So um, it's, yeah, getting around to, um, uh, yeah, passwords and sorting that out and instructions, yeah, their own notes for, Helping themselves at a later later stage, so that's uh, definitely a thing. <laughs> well, now, the last time I saw you, Zoe, you were uh, at Worldcon in Dublin and mm -hmm. managing the social media account. Uh, is that something that that you've been doing more often? Yeah, so that's something I'm getting more into now. So I'm also on the staff for the next two Worldcons. So I'm just helping with New Zealand, which is yeah next August. Uh, I'm not going there, but um, I'm just helping to moderate the. The Facebook stuff, and um, I'm going to be going to Washington the year after. Oh, nice! So I'm area head for social media for that. So um, yeah, I'm really enjoying sort of getting into that side of things, managing social media accounts, so promoting the kind of things that are happening at the conventions, and it's a whole wide range of things that happen. As you know, you know what Worldcons are like. So um, yeah, so I really enjoy that. I'm on social media anyway all the time, so it's no. Um, uh, well, I'm not sort of spending necessarily any more time on yeah, it, right. but but it is quite a lot of uh, quite, it can be quite a lot of work with the run up for the weeks before the convention. So, yeah. Really All right. Uh, before we move on, Zoe, do you have any questions for us? I do. Yeah, traveling. Talking about uh, traveling on planes, and it, I know you have talked about traveling with tech before and the mm -hmm. technology used. But what what kind of challenges do you have when you're traveling with your technology, especially on a plane? You have to make compromises with, with what you can't take with you and uh, that sort of thing, just generally about traveling with, with tech. Well, I know for I, I do a fair amount of uh, traveling for a podcast, which requires me to pack, you know, four microphones and stands and a preamp and a mixer and a laptop and lots of XLR cables and the whole thing. And 
it actually gets pretty compact. I can get that into, it's a pretty stuffed backpack, but I can get into a backpack that I'm with the whole time. I will never check that. It is precious cargo. You know how that all goes. But I've definitely gotten to situations where, especially on small planes, where yeah, I had the misfortune of not being able to board until a little bit later and they want to check it. And I'm like, nope, I am not checking this. There's just no way. Because once it's broken, my job is over, you know, it, and yeah. you know, it's not only expensive, but going to be um, really, really uh, a huge burden for everybody who's waiting for me on the other side. So that is and also going through TSA where everyone thinks like I'm a DJ, but they're confused and they look at all my equipment and go like, what is this like weird thing that you've got? You know, it, it looks like a weapon. So it's a it's a conversation I have uh, over and over. I've gotten a little bit better about packing it in a way, knowing that they're going to take it apart. So I can just pack it again as quickly as possible because I know they will. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but yeah, it's it's I think I think the key for me anyway is whatever else you got pack light because you have to keep your equipment with you. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't have too much more to add to that. I mean, the, the few things that I do that that are tricks is I, I keep all my cables in a single bag so that when I'm pulling them in and out uh, of my suitcase, it's easy to know where everything is. And in fact, I'll usually pack the mics in there, too. Uh, but I will always find <clears throat> something that, uh, like you say, Sarah, security is going to flag. There there was a mic stand that I had for a long time that had a really weighty base, and mm. it always caused them to want to look at it because it was so heavy and solid. And it was never a problem once they saw what it was, but I, I started to put that in a separate bag. It was actually a bag from Target, and I would pull it out of my suitcase, and I'd even have people saying, oh, you don't, you don't have to pull things out of your, you're in TSA pre, and I'm like, no, nope, you're going to want this out. Uh, and several times people would look, like from the x-ray machine, just reach in, look in the bag, and go, oh, okay. And it's just yeah. saved me time. So I've, I've picked up little tricks like that. I think you had the same mic stand that I have, Sarah, that, that often looks like a butterfly knife. Uh, mm -hmm. Because it's got holes in the in the uh, base, and that's another one where I I tend to put it at the top of my bag, so it's real easy to for them to pull out and, and take a look at it. That one doesn't always get pulled aside, uh, but that's it. It's mostly security based stuff. It's mostly yeah, it's security and just uh, and making sure that things that are delicate, which they are, aren't getting thrown around, you know, in baggage below. Yeah, I will some of the stuff just can't. I can't check that. I, stuff. It's all carry on for me, all my podcasting yeah. stuff, and I will put yeah. things like my iSickle XLR adapter in my laptop bag rather than my suitcase because it's a little more delicate, and I want to make sure that it, I've got it in a place that's gentle. So, yeah. All right, let's move along, shall we? Let's move along. Sheila Dunn, the communications director for the National Motorist Association, which is a grassroots nonpartisan group of motorists from across the U.S. Sheila, tell us about the National Motorist Association. What do you do? What does it do? And 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 what's the goal? Yeah, sure. Um, the NMA started back in the day when the federal government imposed the 55 miles per hour speed limit on everyone, and the the founder was uh, instrumental in getting that that revoked. So that's how it got started. Now we've branched out to a lot of other different sorts of uh, things that we advocate for. Like we uh, advocate against anything automated uh, traffic enforcement, like uh, red light cameras, speed cameras, uh, green light cameras, which is the combination of the two, uh, facial recognition, and uh, automated license plate readers. We still uh, advocate for, for saying traffic laws and speed limits. So we're continuously um, working towards that. In my position, I'm the communications director, so I serve as the primary media spokesperson, so I do a lot of interviews, been doing a lot of interviews in New York City lately because there's so much going on there. Um, I also attended the uh, Keep the Los Angeles Moving Conference in October, and so we're starting to work with the Keep the U.S. Moving folks. They're, um, we're opposing um, putting uh, road diets on streets that have, our, we call them arterial streets, that have more than 20,000 cars per day because um, it does cause a lot more traffic issues. And it also is really unsafe for, for a lot of reasons. So, so there's a lot of things I do in terms of that. Um, I uh, also, uh, I work on four blogs a week. Um, I, two of them are like curated headlines. So one's on the, called the ATE Racket Report. 
And it's the uh, automated, which ATE stands for Automated Traffic Enforcement. And this just headlines from the, the past week. And it's usually a 15 to 20 headlines of things going around the country. The other one is called the War on Cars Watch. And uh, it's uh, everything from uh, what's going on, you know, with the expense of Vision Zero, uh, Complete Streets, um, and then also Road Diets, Traffic Calming. And we do other things, too. So it's all different kinds of things than that. I also do another blog called Driving in America. That's repurposing some of the content that, that's been written before. We have a lot of content on our website. And also sometimes I do original pieces or have guest pieces. And then the last thing I do, I uh, started out as the Car of the Future blog. And I did that for about, I think, two years. And then um, and ra- I started to realize that the hype for Car of the Future has was really like the balloon was being deflated. And I decided, you know, it's really more of an auto tech thing. So I, I changed the blog name to Auto Tech Watch, and now I write um, a blog. I try to write it every week. It doesn't always happen. but And um, so I do do a lot of that. And then I also write um, – we have a weekly newsletter on one topic, and so I write on that. And then I also edit our quarterly magazine called Driving Freedoms. Wow. Uh, wow. You are a busy woman. My goodness. Very busy. Very, yeah. very busy. And yes. it sounds like, I mean, you have a lot of passion for privacy, security, certainly safety. Definitely, definitely. All so, of the above. Um, surveillance is, a, I think, a huge issue. There's been so many articles about facial surveillance that are coming out and all the things that are happening, Chinese surveillance, and then going, selling it to other like countries like Bolivians places. You're just wondering what the heck is going on, you know? So mm-hmm. well, there's so, with, so much going on with all the tools that you're aware of and certainly, um, and keeping tabs on how has technology impacted your life personally? Well, I, um, I'm, a, you know, I'm not a, I, I, I wouldn't call myself a techie. I'm more of a content provider. So, um, like for example, I've tried to understand HTML code, but I just don't get it. So, you know, it's, that's well, sort of problem. That's why so, we wanted to introduce you to Chance. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm willing to help. <laughs> yeah, so that's my, and I, you know, tried to do the online courses. And one time I tried to learn C+, and I got up really early to oh. learn it. I couldn't even get C+, to turn on. So, you know, that's where I'm at um, in terms of trying to learn tech. But I, I actually know Google really well. I wouldn't call myself a prof, you know, professional Googler, but I use Google Sheets and Docs almost all the time. And I've used Google Mail for years. I have a lot of email addresses. I don't not want to go into that really, but <laughs> I'm, I'm very, um, I'm very tech poor. That's one of my biggest problems. That's, um, you know, I have a six, uh, I, I have iPhone six plus. Okay. That's where I'm at in the iPhone realm. And you know, while we were talking, I've already had to plug it in cause my battery has been dying lately. So I'm going to have to get a new phone soon. Um, I have three computers at home. They're all garbage. You know, the last one's on its last leg. It's a ThinkPad. I've, uh, we have a MacBook Pro. This doesn't work anymore. I've already had to get a new engine for that. And then I have a 2008, you know, iMac, which doesn't really work anymore. So, you know, I'm very tech poor. I also, you know, I have a, a 17-year-old child. So we have a lot mm-hmm. of issues with, uh, and he likes to watch America, uh, soccer or what we call football because we lived in Europe for a while. And and, you know, just to watch American soccer, you have to have like three different subscriptions to three different things. And it's like a fortune. So I'm very tech poor. Um, I have a lot of email addresses. I have password problems. I use iPassword, but every single time I still have a password problem, you know. Uh, so it's really, really frustrating. I just looked at how many emails, uh, personal emails I have right now. I think it's over 2,000. I don't even know why. Because, uh, you know, I'm getting ready to go through my yearly purge. I, I have to purge a lot of stuff because I'm always like looking at new stuff. You know, put my my email address in, and then I never look at it again. So that's what I have. To, I have to do that. And Is there just, a? Could I never ask go, a never question, stops. Sheila? Sure. Yeah, please. Um, I was curious. I want to go back to your auto surveillance thing. Yeah, I sure. I want to ask if you know um, anything about. I I know there's companies that actually make money working with tow truck drivers, and they grab license plates, and they store it all and track people. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, you know, uh, there's, well, you know, there's so much s- stuff like that going on. There's just, just a big story. I think it was in Vice or Motherboard or something today about the California DMV selling, uh, you know, driver's license information and, s- and they're making $50 million a year. Florida does that. I think a number of other states do that. Um, tow truck drivers, you know, there's a whole thing with predatory tow- towing. And um, it's a huge, it's been a huge problem in Chicago and, you know, Philadelphia, a lot of other places. 
And um, what they do is they use an automated license plate reader, which is, you know, they can scan your license plate. They go through parking lots. And if you, like, are behind in your car payments or, you know, have a, some of the problem, they'll confiscate your car. So, yeah, so that happens. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's frightening what's going on out there. I mean, uh, it's just I don't think people are really aware of it. And I think motorists yeah. certainly aren't. Do you motorists remember are pretty Steve, oblivious, so. Do you remember the Steve Goodman song, Lincoln Park Pirates? Uh, no, I'm sorry. It was about people in Chicago towing you to make money. And this is this is this is from back in 1972. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so I mean, I Chicago. I mean, I'm not trying to be mean to Chicago, but they, I mean, they have the red light camera situation there is just outrageously bad, and they've had corruption scandal, corruption, you know, beyond. I mean, it's just like amazing that. I just don't even understand. So now Illinois is trying to ban red light cameras in the state. It'll be an interesting fight to see if it happens. Texas banned them this year. So that was really, uh, really exciting to see. But because, you know, the, the problem with automated traffic enforcement, you get a ticket. In a lot of places, it doesn't even count towards your insurance. They just want the cash. So it's really like a taxation by citation sort of thing. Right. It's not really about safety. I can remember um, reading an article about the New Orleans uh, mayor, Mitch Landrew, who um, – stated in, in his like i don't know yearly address that we're going to be putting more 50 more you know speed cameras and red light camera cameras in the city because we need the cash and uh he got voted out and the woman that replaced him she said well we're going to get rid of him and guess what she hasn't gotten rid of him because cities <laughs> get used to this uh get used to this cash and they just they just don't know they can't get rid of it and um you know when you have little ladies calling from florida and saying you know i just got a, a red light camera ticket i got caught in, you know trying to turn left i went to court to fight my ticket and all the all the people that were there were little old ladies and i'm thinking that's just really bad well so, sheila anyway. before we move on uh, do you have any sure. questions for us yeah um you know are you guys concerned at all that um that autos really aren't that secure in terms of connections i wrote a story this summer um called is this vehicle secure but is by design and these these statistics really jumped out at me a Dreamliner jet uses about 6.5 million lines of programming code, while a late model Ford F-150 pickup requires more than 20 times that amount. And I'm, and you know, it ha it's not really secure. And I just don't know why we're going headlong into this pace of trying to connect everything and trying to, you know, have a driverless car. When, you know, t I mean, literally day after day, there's an auto recall on two different things. Mercedes just had two recalls today. I mean, I'm just thinking, what is going on here? Why do why do we need driverless cars when we can't even fix the cars we have? So well, that's I, my I, question. you know, I think it's sensible uh, a way to approach technology in general, not even just cars, is is to prioritize security more than we have in the past. And and I don't think cars should be an exception to that any more than your smart home or anything else. And and so, yeah, my, the way I would answer that is the way I answer industry wide is we need to move security up the priority list uh, more than we have because yeah, totally. security by obscurity just doesn't work anymore, you know? Nope, it doesn't. I totally security. agree with that. Okay. Security I was just doesn't curious. make money. That's the problem. Yeah, it's just, it's not a cash cow. You're right. I mean, mm. yeah, okay, we have that. I mean, you know, even even the article, I mean, R &D, <clears throat> there's not even any art security, cybersecurity units at automakers. Do you realize that? I mean, it's just shocking how they don't even think about the security aspects. When yeah. they're designing these cars. And I'm talking about cars just now. I'm not even talking about cars of the future. I'm talking about cars that are coming out today. Yeah, so it's something so. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll keep even more of an eye on on Daily Tech News Show. It's a, it's okay. a good point. Yep. Uh, Chris Allen, uh, owner of the Cleveland Rock Gym in Cleveland, Ohio, software engineer uh, before that. Uh, you, you, it says you bought the uh, gym in 2012. That's and uh, I, I've got to add, Chris, uh, Chris has been a huge supporter of Daily Tech News Show from the beginning. I don't want to embarrass him by telling all the ways that he supported it, but I appreciate every <laughs> single one of them, Chris. You're amazing. It was based on a um, uh, Tom threw out a um, challenge at one point to um, try and bring, in, bring enough Patreons on to bring Peter Wells in mm -hmm. every week at, to add some additional or every other week to add some international flavor. And um, I uh, brazenly said, you know what? We're not meeting the goal. I will uh, I will uh, I will make up the difference. 
And then I realized that was a thousand dollars a month, and I said, <laughs> uh, "Tom, I did a miscalculation, <laughs> but I will at least contribute a little bit." And so, uh, yeah, that uh, uh, that's uh, how that started. Well, and, and even even without a thousand dollars a month, you've been very generous uh, to to me and the show. So we appreciate that. Uh, first of all, before we get to the the rock climbing stuff, what what was yeah. your job as a software engineer? Um, I was uh, doing a lot of uh, full stack development, which meant I was working in the database side of things as well as the front end stuff, the things that you would see on the web. Um, we were doing a lot of financial uh, institutions, and um, you talk about how scary autos are. Uh, the banks are also quite scary when it comes to how your money gets moved around. Oh, um, totally. But, uh, but uh, we did a lot of that kind of stuff. And um, after doing that for so many years, I just kind of got burnt out on it. So, so, so just... Too much, too much time, too much stress. Uh, no work-life balance. Is that yeah, what I'm hearing? yeah. It was. It's. It, it's a competitive field, um, and um, I, I had a great time doing it. But um, over the years, I just, you know, uh, they always say that you should do something that you love, and I loved it, but I didn't love it sixty hours a week. Love it. So. Sure. Uh, yeah, it was time to it was time to find something new. You know, I, I, back in the day, I remember rock climbing was like a thing that I mean, lots of people already knew how to do it, but but indoor climbing gyms kind of became a thing in San Francisco, and certainly with the tech set. Do you find talking to your clients that that there are a lot of people in technology who are looking to blow off some steam? Actually, yeah, I, Sarah, you're completely correct. Um, it's been amazing to me. I, I, I think of, uh, I think the perception is that it, climbers are a bunch of uh, people that are taking off time between high school and college, but in reality, it's a lot of uh, attorneys, doctors. We have a big NASA facility nearby, uh, so a lot of engineers are in here. Um, I uh, around the time that the medical exams go on, there's people in here with their books and their flashcards, and they'll climb a little bit and then take a break for a few minutes and study and then go back on the wall. But it's a very um, it's a very intelligent group of people. I'm I was really shocked by that, but you're completely correct in that. Do you, so. What what made you pick rock climbing? What what made that the thing that you decided to to make the jump from software engineer to do? So I was a software engineer uh, at a local company. I came on board and um, got the standard cubicle and was working there for a week. And none of the other people around me came by to say hi, welcome aboard, or anything like that. Um, mostly because they were in a different division, even though we were cubbies right next to each other. And so about a week after I started, another guy came on board um, in the cubby next to mine. And I said, you know what, I'm not going to treat him the way everybody's been treating me. So I went and introduced myself and we both thought we'd give it a shot and we gave it a shot in 2001 and I've been climbing ever since. That's, that's, cool. that's amazing. That's like living yeah. your dream. Oh yeah. 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 Well, and people do say, and I'm I'm not much of a climber, although I I like scaling a hill here and there. But people do say once you, once you get really into it, it is the best workout. It really is. It is. It's a real good full body workout. It doesn't get your chest so well, but the back, the legs, the arms it does really well. Um, if you're gonna want to do a lot of climbing, I don't suggest buying a rock gym because you're gonna be busy doing uh, a lot of management stuff. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I I know that feeling a little bit. Sometimes it's like, wait, I really need to to do my the job, not the business, but the business is a job on its own. Uh, do you use a lot of technology in the gym? Um, so there's not a lot of technology that gets done in a gym. It's it's somewhat similar to the stories you hear about NASA using older equipment mm -hmm. um, because they want the reliability. The stuff that we use is um, very. Uh, it tends to be. I don't want to use the word simple because that has the wrong connotation, but there's there's not a lot of complexity to a lot of the stuff that we use We because we have tried and true methods that work. Um, sure. 
I would say that on the engineering side, there's probably quite a bit of technology that goes into the engineering of figuring out metals or, or, mm. or other materials that might go into things like that. But from a, from a user standpoint, we don't use a lot of technology. I, I specifically use a lot of technology in managing the business, but a, as a climber, um, I don't, I think you could get pretty unplugged from the technology world and still climb for several years without missing a beat. When you talk about managing, you're talking about like QuickBooks invoicing, stuff like that. Oh yeah. All that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, managing employees, uh, overtime taxes, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, fun stuff. Good stuff. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, do you have any questions for us, Chris? Um, I actually do have a question. Um, both of you seem to do a lot of extra side projects and I know DTNS is a pretty full-time job. So how many hours are you working? Because I don't <laughs> understand how you get everything done. Uh, Tom, I, I'll, I'll go ahead and take this one. Uh, yeah, indeed, we, you, you start. We all have various side projects, but you're right. Uh, uh, I, uh, with Tom and, and, and Roger and pretty much every peer I have in the podcasting world has, if we're lucky, kind of that, that anchor show, which DTNS absolutely is. And it does for the most part, what I tell people is yeah, I can take a call in the morning might be able to do an errand or two, but mostly I can't do anything until the show is over. And once we're live, I really can't do anything. You know, if somebody comes to the door, I can't answer it uh, because we're, we're a live show. It's live TV. It's kind of, like I said before, it's the same thing. It's just a different medium. But um, but it does afford us enough flexibility to be able to tack on other projects later in the day, perhaps early in the morning, on the weekends. And what's nice is that we have a team that we're all really kind of respectful of each other's schedules. And sometimes somebody has got to dip away and to do something else. And the rest of us will pick up some slack and it works really well for us. Uh, that said, <laughs> I do sometimes think my time management could be better because I don't feel like I ever kind of like wake up on a Saturday and go, ah, cool. Watch some college football. <laughs> and that's all I'm doing today. No, that hasn't happened in a long time. So it's, um, and it's great. It's, it's great to be busy, but at the same time, sometimes working for yourself and taking on projects. I just had, you know, somebody ping me yesterday saying, Hey, we want to do a podcast. We'd love to talk to you. And I was like, great work. But when would I do that? Yeah. yeah. I'll figure it out, I guess. <laughs> but it, you know, it's, it's sort of, you know, that that's, that's always sort of the going problem is how do you manage your time so that you're not just overdoing it and robbing yourself of, you know, a little bit of downtime. Yeah, I probably, I mean, in general, I'm working on Daily Tech News Show from 7 till 2.30-ish, a little bit later than 2.30, depending on the, on the day, because we'll, we'll meet after the show and, and chat about stuff. Yeah. Uh, but, but I, you know, I get up in the morning and I'm looking at headlines and looking at Feedly and that sort of thing. And then the rest of my morning, like you say, like Sarah said, I may take a call with somebody. I may not. Uh, I'm on Wednesdays, I'm on TMS. I'm also doing daily tech headlines on Wednesday, which feeds into daily tech news shows. So there's some nice overlap there, but it is really hard to fit in other things in that time because it's the lead up to a show that has to be reinvented every day. And I'm spending, all, all three of us are spending hours looking at the news, figuring out what should go in, understanding it, not just having a headline, but also, you know, Daily Tech Headlines is a little easier because I, I wouldn't call it cheating, but but you can just write the basics. Whereas on Daily Tech News Show, we need to yeah. actually be able to discuss it and, yeah. and have some thoughts Producing about it. Producing information so. is one thing. Talking yeah. about it is another thing. So I have some tasks. I use a Google Calendar with, with all day tasks as my task list every day. And I have some things in there. Some of them are just like walk the dog. So that I make myself take a break and clear my head, and and that that's probably the biggest thing I've had to learn over the years is how to how to force myself to take breaks away from stuff so that I'm not spending too much time and burning myself out and not and not being productive at the things that I do, and then after after daily tech news show is when I fit in most of the other shows like Current Geek, 
cord killer, sword and laser, all of that. They they happen in that second half of the day, and that's where I'll do my errands. Like get, go get I'm gonna go get groceries after we record this, for instance, uh, mm. stuff like that. So and like you said, Sarah, somebody actually rang my doorbell like 10 minutes ago, uh, and I was not able to go answer it. So but ring right. doorbell made me see right. it probably wasn't worth answering anyway. It's uh it's this is a funny thing that so many of us who do these sorts of jobs we get, but the rest of the world doesn't get where I will have friends be like, Hey, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in your hood. Let's get lunch. And I'm like, it's Wednesday. Yeah. I can't ever get lunch Coffee? Monday through Friday. Like, don't yeah. you know my schedule? It's not their job to know my schedule, but I know it. And I know and that like, it doesn't, it just doesn't work. Can't be done. We talk about this a lot. <laughs> One of the hardest things to get people to understand is a live daily show. They don't understand yeah. that you can't just push it off until later. Right. It, like it happens at one right. It's it, right. you know. Uh, yeah. Like if I'm I, late, I it's a friend. problem. Yeah. I, I yeah, understand I that because I, I, I also do a, I do a, a daily um, email that goes out of driving news headlines mm -hmm. and um, I try to get it out by two every day. But if I get a, a press call or something, it just totally wrecks my schedule and it's yeah, really, yeah. really frustrating. And I'm getting to the point where it's, it's almost overwhelming that the rest of my work. So I, I'm trying, I'm always trying to figure out how to be more efficient, how to cut things out. But at the same time, I do so much cutting and pasting and it doesn't really help when Google changes their algorithm, for example. I mean, I use Google Sheets a lot and like a month ago, they decided to change their algorithm from um, where you could cut and paste a link to another sheet. But now you have to actually relink it. So, you know, oh, that no, puts you, like, you, um, you, yeah, trust me, it puts trust 20 me, you still can. I, I did well, it today. I've tried and tried. I figured it, I <laughs> have not figured it out because it just seemed like it changed uh, a month, a month ago. But, you know, uh, the cutting and pasting and, you know, that, that has a physical toll on you and also the sitting. That's mm -hmm. that's another physical toll. Yeah, that's why I, that's why I put in those things your, that make yeah. you get up and, and, and walk around. Yeah, you uh, know, I walk at lunch. So some yeah. some months ago, I actually it's gotten a lot better because I changed kind of my schedule and I uh, or my um my my city and arrangement and I got a better monitor. But I was having RSI to the point where I was like, I'm not able to edit very well. Like this is like really painful, you know, sitting here for four hours, you know, right. meticulously doing something was actually like hurting me. And I was a little worried, like what, what happens when my right hand goes? I know. Uh, I, I yeah, worry about yeah. that a lot because I'm having a lot of, uh, you know, pain in my, my, you know, fingers now and that's not good. So I, I'm, yeah, I'm trying I mean, to figure out, I wear braces and stuff at night. But yeah. I don't know. Ch changing up the, just, I don't know that. A lot of just angles and stuff had, right. had, has really helped me, but, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a real thing. It, and it, yeah, it, it affects all is. of us. Now, Chris, uh, did you have something you wanted to ask follow up? I just want to say that, um, yeah, from, from, uh, from my schedule, I, I can't always, uh, do things because I might have to fill in for staff or something. And I always get the line from my family, like, but you're the boss. Why can't you just make time to <laughs> go out for lunch and stuff. And right, it's like, right. because I'm the boss, I'm the last line. I have to, I have to do stuff. So I just wanted to give you guys kudos for the amount of stuff that you guys get done every single day. It's, Thanks, I'm just man. floored by that. Yes, and, thank and you so much. Consistently, please take the, please take the, the holidays off uh, when you, uh, you know, the, the, those weird bank holidays. Yeah. Please take those off and re-energize because it's uh, impressive how much you guys get done each week. Well, thank you all uh, for being with us today and uh, and helping us to have this December 26th off. Oh, I, I, I tore aside the veil. We're not really here. It was pre-recorded. Uh, William <laughs> Chance Perigini, thank you so much. Anything to tell folks about before we leave? Um, yeah, if you need some websites built, I do that. Or if you want to hire a web dev remotely, I'll also do that. Chancethehacker.com. Go check it out. Uh, Zoe Dutterding, how about you? Well, I'm I'm always on social media. You can always track me down if you want a page managing. Then uh, I'm your person. I'll even bring you bacon. <laughs> so uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I like I can, I can swear by it. It really does mm -hmm. happen. Yep. Uh, thank mm -hmm. you so much, Zoe. Uh, Sheila Dunn, uh, anything you want to let people know about before we go? Yeah, you know, if you want to check out the National Motorist Association, we're at www.motorist.org. It's pretty simple. It's a plural, motorist.org. And we also are on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Pinterest. And Chris Allen, where's your gym? 
Uh, I'm actually in Cleveland, Ohio, but I would like to let people know that they need to get outside and enjoy things. Don't get trapped in your technology bubbles. Excellent. Uh, ClevelandRockGym.com. If you're just curious and you want to see Chris, what Chris's place looks like, you can go check that out as well. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for supporting the show. Uh, we are in our holiday episodes right now, as you may have noticed. Uh, but we will be back on, uh, what is it? It's it's not, a, not in here. On <laughs> January 3rd. Something. Next week. Yeah, it's, it's going to be January 3rd. Second, second, right? Thursday. January 2nd. We'll be back on Thursday, January 2nd with normal episodes. And then right after that, CES is happening. And we will be at uh, the Consumer Electronics Show on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, the 6th, 7th, and 8th of January with special episodes from there. Don't miss that. Uh, thank you, everyone, again, for supporting us at patreon.com slash DTNS. And if you have feedback for our listener co-host show, with four great co-hosts, our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2130 UTC in our regular schedule. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. See you tomorrow with our 2019 predictions results show. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> Good show, Excellent. everybody. That was great. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, all. So that was so good. Thank you so much. That went well. Wow. Yeah. The, the, the funniest thing for me is that I listen to all podcasts on double speed. <laughs> so <laughs> you guys sound like you're <laughs> trashed right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, oh, I was going to thank him for talking 1.6 times slower. You need oh, to make sure we, we, we sound like we're trashed because you're, we're usually so much snappier <laughs> for you. Usually, yeah. so usually <laughs> the, the podcast goes so quickly, it, it, you're literally at double speed. So I, to me, your normal voices are way faster. Oh, that's so slightly funny. higher pitched. So it sounds like you got a deeper voice and yeah. you're talking so slow. We're like now, now, Jan. It's funny when yeah. you have Justin any Robert, questions for me. Justin Robert Young was sending me his uh, "Raise the Dead" <laughs> podcast in advance for me to listen to and give feedback on, and I'm used to listening to him at two x speed. So. Yeah. I was listening at a Dropbox where you can't speed it up. And I, I kept saying, like, I don't know. It feels like it's a little slow. And yeah. then I realized, oh, no, it's not slow. I'm just used to hearing him at chipmunk speed. So yeah, exactly. I totally know what you're talking about. It's so funny. It, it's really hard to get past for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe we are just really, really slow. There's also or that. really chat. <laughs> yeah. we, we all hey, you guys, you guys do a great job, before. and thank you so much for doing what you do. I know oh, it's hard work, you. and um, oh, yeah, I've been listening for that. about a year. I started listening about a year ago when I realized I wanted to listen to more podcasts, and you're the only uh, tech show I, I listen to on a podcast. Oh, I, oh, and um, Yeah, I listen and to I a listen lot of to it. Uh, I use Overcast. I just want to say that because I, I try to use the Apple podcasting thing, and it was just garbage, and I never could listen to anything because I couldn't get it to work properly. But Overcast allows me to put everybody in folders, and you're in my daily one folder. I have two oh, daily folders, so I just wanted to, to tell right. you that. So Yeah, that's very nice. Yeah, I listen to a bunch of tech podcasts, and you guys are hands down my favorite. I love this oh, show. Thanks, man. I really Thank like your you. news and your discussions. I think that really um, – it's really important, and um, – you actually are able to articulate things that um, I read about. And so it's really good to, to get that refresher as well. So that's so good to hear. Cause that, that's really our main goal is to, to make you feel a little more well-informed without right, having exactly. to spend those hours that I was talking about earlier uh, doing it. That's what we're here for. And I like your international feel as well, which doesn't always come across very well with other podcasts. Mm -hmm. It can do, but uh, American based pod podcasts, whereas your you're definitely very, you know, got a very global feel to the, yeah, to yeah. the show. So. No, we work hard on that. And and yep. having Patrick Beja around helps uh, too. So, yeah. And actually, Zoe, having you around helps too. <laughs> <laughs> Bringing the British bacon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll, well, we'll have fun at CES. That sounds really fun. Yes. I've never been there, but mm -hmm. I always, always thought it would be fun to go. So You should. The first it. four times I went was really fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's in Vegas, right? Yeah, yeah. it's in Vegas. Yeah. 
There's great yeah. rock climbing. Maybe someday I'll go, but I just haven't had the chance yet, so it sounds like a lot of fun. Got to pay for all those subscriptions you know, first. It, it is always fun, I, as as Tom yeah. was alluding to after. It's tiring. It's after, tiring. It, it is. That's what it is. It's work. You know, it's working in Vegas it's, is it yeah. is a challenge because it's just hard to get anywhere. It's just hard. It's Especially just, it's not a walking CES, city. You know? yeah. So you guys actually do your podcast from there? Okay. Yeah, I didn't. We do. I don't remember that from last year. Or this yeah, year, I guess, we started so. doing that two years ago. We started doing it from the show floor. Wow, that's uh, hard. To yeah. Do. yeah. So this will be yeah, our. Show. You guys get to actually oh. see each other, so that's kind of fun too. Well, Steve oh. Sheridan actually on the floor, wasn't he? I think. Um, yes. Yes. He, yeah, he was <laughs> in the booth. He was literally on the show <laughs> Steve floor. Steve and yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Allison. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And it's and it's good because. Between the three of us, we must have at least a hundred people, former colleagues, coworkers that we run into. Oh, yeah. the show. So it's always like catching up. It's a good chance to reconnect with people. Mm. For sure. All right, folks, we'll I'll let you get back to the rest yeah. of the day. But uh, thank you um, again. Thank you again, yes. all thank of you. you so this much. was so fun. It was fun, and you guys are awesome. You're yeah. a good co host. Start your own podcast. <laughs> yeah, thank we'll you. We'll be all guests right. on your podcast. Yeah, totally. Okay. <laughs> Ooh, nice. Thanks very much. Okay, bye. Right. Thank bye. You guys. Bye, everybody. Bye.